we're good. All right. Thank you everyone for coming to the December 5th meeting of the Clean Water Board. Uh, just running through the agenda really quick after uh, my welcome, we're going to spend about half an hour on the uh, reviewing the public comment that was submitted for the draft state fiscal year 2025 budget. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for board member discussion. Uh, and then we'll have a half an hour for public comment after that. And then we'll move with the uh, adoption of the budget. We've got a draft motion uh, to go there and then we'll move into other business. Um, so as part of this, the consent agenda for today, we have the meeting minutes from the October 9th meetings. We have the minutes from the public hearing on November 2nd. And then we also have the September 15th uh, Clean Water Fund operating statement. It's an update to the sheets revenue uh, projection methodology there. So if there are no objections from members of the board, we will move on to our uh, public comment. Review that is. All right. Uh, so Gianna and Colleen. Great, thank you. It's going to pull up a PowerPoint. Oh, slide. yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have about one PowerPoint slide to share for Colin's piece. Trying to make it full. There. Perfect. Okay. So I'm just going to quick, quickly I give do. a overview on uh, the public comment period, what that looked like. So um, the timeline you might remember, we started it off on October 9th with a it's public meeting right. where we originally presented the budget to the board. Then we had a month long public comment period from October 20th to November 20th, where the public was encouraged to uh, tell us their thoughts on the budget. And then we had a public hearing on November 2nd, where um, the public was asked for their thoughts once again. So in terms of taking public uh, public opinion into account, we had a few different methods that we went through. So we had an online questionnaire where they were uh, able to give their thoughts on specific line items and just on the budget as a whole, as well as the budget process. We allowed uh, the public to submit written responses through our email address and then at the public hearing on the second, as I mentioned. What our outreach looked like was we had a press release, MailChimp emails, and social media. These were all uh, sent out at different times during the process period. And these all were connected back to some core documents like um, our original overview document, our story maps. They all had the same information. We just kind of presented them in different ways depending on the, out, uh, the audience that we were speaking with. So Emily, could you just go to the next slide? Yeah, this just is some visuals about what that outreach looked like. So you'll see on the left is a press release and the center is a social media post um, announcing the clean water budget public hearing. This was posted on both, both Instagram and Facebook. And then on the right is an example of a MailChimp email. We sent quite a few of these reminding the public about the public comment period as a whole and the different meetings that we had during this process. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Gianna, who's going to dive deeper into the public comment. Okay, thanks, Colleen. <clears throat> and Emily is going to be pulling up a screen share of the memorandum. That's an attachment, of a meeting material attachment for today for you all. And so thanks, thanks everyone for your time today. I'm basically just going to be walking through this document for you all. So starting up at the top, Big picture upon review of the public comment that was received. One change to the budget is recommended. We'll talk about that a bit more when we get to category three below. But this proposed change to the budget is reflected in the updated budget sheet that the board has before them today as well. So Colleen just talked about three ways that we received public comment during the public comment period, emails, the questionnaire, and the public hearing. We received eight emails, we got 14 questionnaire responses, and we had 12 public hearing attendees with two commenters. Attached to this memo and the materials for today is all the raw responses and comments to the questionnaire, emails, and a transcript from the public hearing, so the board can access the, the raw data should they be interested in, in terms of consideration. 
As far as the approach, the approach to building together this um, memorandum and responding to public comments, similar to prior years, we've, we've followed a very standard process where we compiled all of the materials, we reviewed them and started to put them into categories based on similarities. Um, we highlighted which are within the purview of the Clean Water Board. If things were maybe not in the purview of the Clean Water Board, we did try to follow up with appropriate staff. And then this memorandum proposes a, a draft response for the board to review. <laughs> this memorandum this year does have a note on the participation levels for the public comment process. So you may you may have noticed that, that it's actually quite low this year. Um, we did put a, a quick graph in here to show people and visualize that it has been on a decreasing trend, at least since 2021, where we could easily access this data. But in particular this year, the numbers were alarmingly low. So we think it's really important to present this up front before we talk about the public comment that was received, because it does challenge um, the board's ability to sort of elevate much of this into a theme or a trend, given the low volume. <clears throat> so you, you will see a key difference between this year and last year in that we don't call these themes, we call these categories, which might feel a bit like semantics, but we wanted to really make sure the board was understanding they're just clustered by similarity of topic, but may not elevate to the uh, a theme or trend. We're not entirely sure some of the reasons for this decrease. Um, uh, the Clean Water Initiative Program wants to be looking into this or plans to be looking into this for, for preparation to increase participation for state fiscal year 2026. Although some possible reasons for the limited participation could be the fact that the clean water budget and supporting materials are quite complex, despite our best efforts to put it into plain language. Um, it could reflect on the reach and effectiveness of our publicizing of the public comment period. It could be a result of the increased volume of funding in the system over time and the limited ability of the public to respond and engage. Or it could be reflective of an increased comfort level with the budget recommendations proposed by the board and a decreased feeling of needing to, to submit comments. So it could or it could be a reason unlisted here. So we're really not sure. But these are some things that we're presenting to the board for consideration. And then the last thing before I dive into the categories is highlighting the, the demographic spread of the comments that we did receive. Again, it's it's pretty limited. It heavily weights the Lake Champlain Basin counties, mostly concerned residents and recreational users, and most likely audiences who have already connected with the clean water um, program in the past. They mostly heard about the survey through the listserv, so unlikely that we've reached new audiences this year in terms of the feedback we received. So that aside, we'll start to walk through the categories. So the first category is the total clean water fund um, annual revenue. So there's a question in the questionnaire that asks the public whether they think there are sufficient revenue in the clean water fund to support all the priorities in the full clean water budget. So we ask this of the public because it is within the board purview to consi consider the sufficiency of fund revenue. In terms of responses, 29% answered yes, which is very similar to last year. 43% answered no, which is up quite a bit from last year. And 29 answered unsure, which is slightly down from last year. Our response to this in general, there's a slight majority that's either yes or unsure. So there's maybe not a strong opposition to the current revenue levels. You will notice the percentage of people who indicated no or feel the revenue is not sufficient jumped quite a bit and if you just look at the percentages um admittedly the clean water fund revenue is a slightly lower than last year but only by about a hundred thousand dollars in a pool of 25.8 million so we think this huge jump percentage wise is either due to the small sample size or people looking more at the full clean water budget which is notably smaller than last year so no budget change or action recommended as a result of this and Gianna, just to be clear, the reason the clean water budget is small is because the ARPA funding is right. no longer in FY20. Right, exactly. Thank you, Secretary Moore. Moving on to category two, there is a there are a suite of questions in the questionnaire that ask whether respondents agree with the proportion of funds allocated to each tier, tier one, tier two, tier three, and other respectively. And most respondents answered, answered either yes or unsure to all of these questions, indicating no strong opposition to this breakdown and reflective general support for um, what the board has been trying to do, which is aiming for a 60-30-10 uh, 
um, division of, of the budget. So no budget changes proposed here. The third category is a cluster of questions or funding requests that um, we could assign to a specific line item for board consideration. So the first is line 1.2, which is basin planning and basin water quality council participation, education and outreach. The board received an email comment that represented roughly 40 entities statewide that were requesting an increase to this line item from 650,000 to 850,000. The reason accounting for the cost increase pressures, including inflation and increased workload associated with the Basin Water Quality Council role that is tasked to them. There was one comment on the questionnaire that indicated line 2.3 looked generally underfunded. That's the water quality farm improvement and retirement projects. And there was one comment in the questionnaire requesting more funding for municipal sewage infrastructure, which generally applies to lines 4.4 or 4.5. In terms of the response, um, because we received singular requests regarding lines 2.3, 4.4, and 4.5, and can't really wait whether there's a, there's a general public consensus around those requests, no budget change is proposed. Regarding line 1.2, the Basin Water Quality Council Participation and tactical basin planning support, given that this email represented quite a large constituent base, this merits some discussion and the responsiveness summary does that, provides this discussion. So the proposed response to this is that DEC acknowledges the valuable role of the statutory partners. This includes regional planning commissions, natural resource districts, and watershed organizations in terms of them supporting tactical basin planning and basin water quality um, council participation. And we also acknowledge the very real inflationary pressures that can limit or decrease the volume of work we could expect from these partners with a level funded line item. With the board considering this request, the board should be aware that tactical basin planning awards are really a long term commitment to support participatory watershed level planning. So DEC thinks that this request should be considered a request to increase the base funding and not be addressed as a one time funding request. Considering that, the board may wish to consider whether an increase in base funding is sustainable in the long term and at what impact and cost to other budget priorities. The EC is also unsure whether the full request of $200,000 um, is what the tactical basin planning funding gap amounts to. Um, given that there are other funding initiatives within the budget that support similar um, activities and could offset some of the pressures on this line item. Namely, um, lines 1.1, the Clean Water Service Provider Funding, and 1.31, Enhancement Grants, Support Project Development Work, and line 1.52, Program and Partner Support, includes, a line, includes work to support workforce capacity development, which is, again funds similar activities. So with all that consideration, DEC does propose that the Clean Water Board adjust the budget by increasing this line by $100,000 from 650 to 750,000, which is a 15% increase. DEC recommends that um, this funding come from line 1.52, the program and partner support line item. That's what's reflected in your budget, the, the moving of 100,000 from one line to the other. And DEC also recommends that the board commit to revisit the base funding levels in the future, um, should further adjustment be warranted in state fiscal year 26. We recognize that having the funding come from the program and partner support can be of concern for some partners as the email request does ask that this increase doesn't come at the cost of um, uh, project development or capacity funding. Making this proposal this way, we think it does not necessarily come at the cost of those other, other efforts. As mentioned, project development is funded by other line items. And specifically, um, DEC believes given that program and partner support supports multiple sub initiatives, there's more flexibility in this line item to absorb and spread the impact of the reduction and reprioritize. So DEC plans to use the annual spending plan process to reprioritize these sub initiatives and allocate funding as appropriate. Under category four, there were also some general funding requests that we could not assign to specific line items. Um, one questionnaire respondent requested more funding for natural resource conservation districts. Another questionnaire respondent requested more funding for culvert upsizing. And then uh, the board received an email comment requesting equipment purchase support to municipalities. 
to reduce road salt application and chloride pollution. All of these we clustered as falling outside the purview of the Clean Water Board because the board makes recommendations at the line item or funding program level. Um, but we do list in this response how these either um, partners or practice types can receive funding. So natural resource conservation districts can access both project and program funding through multiple line items listed here. Culvert upsizing is a practice type that is supported through multiple line items listed here. And the equipment support request was sent over to the staff at the Agency of Transportation. The Agency of Transportation line items in the Clean Water Budget mostly focus on compliance with the Municipal Roads General Permit, which doesn't regulate road salt application, but nonetheless, the request was sent over for their consideration. So no budget changes proposed here. There were a few questions and comments regarding generally the Clean Water Board and budget approach. One email comment asked about board representation, expertise, and assignment terms. One questionnaire suggested that the board adopt a five-year budget planning cycle for increased predictability and stability. And another questionnaire respondent requested more information on the basis of the prioritization of funds. So the response here really just points to um, the statute that dictates quite a bit of this. Um, again, the statutory priorities established in 10 VSA 1389 are for the Clean Water Fund, and they sort of dictate what falls into Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. And the response summary links to the statute and also refers folks to the Clean Water Budget Overview document, which provides more information about the tiering. The response also acknowledges that the state legislature through statute intentionally selected these agency secretaries from everyone that sits on this board as, um, as a recognition that this should be an interagency partnership to support the Clean Water Initiative and that each agency brings sector specific knowledge and expertise. And then the response um, provides some information about public members to the Clean Water Board that they are appointed by the governor that the governor's office facilitates a formal application process and we provide the link here for folks to learn more. And then in regards to the suggestion for the five year budgeting cycle for predictability, um, the response mentions that the clean water budget is a is a recommendation that comes out of the clean water board and gets integrated into the, the governor's annual request to the legislature. So this aligns with that annual statewide budgeting process. And given that uh, the uncertainty in revenue forecasting in the long run, the board has usually cautioned against budget planning beyond this, this annual window, so no change is proposed. There was one questionnaire respondent indicating concern of an overemphasis of funding in Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog. Although we only received one response of this this year, this has been a, a trend or theme in prior years as well. So as of the most recent Vermont Clean Water Initiative performance report, which was released in January, about one third of all state clean water investments go towards the Hudson and Connecticut River watersheds, and two thirds go towards Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog basins. So this is above and beyond just what's in the clean water budget. It's all state clean water investments. Um, oh, I lost, oh, I'm right here, sorry. Uh, and, and while this isn't a precisely an equal distribution, there are still some statutory drivers that force um, some of the clean water budget to continue to overemphasize Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog. Or, or for example, line 1.1, the water quality restoration formula grants managed by the clean water service providers, that's really only available to target phosphorus reductions in Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog currently, although it may be expanded statewide at some point. And then line 2.24, the municipal three acre general permit is supporting um, municipalities to achieve compliance with stormwater regulations, which really are only applicable right now in Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog. In addition, line 1.31 are the statewide non regulatory clean water project line. It supports a suite of sub initiatives, which are all required to emphasize or prioritize funds outside of um, Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog to support this geographic equity a bit more. And that's funded at statutory maximum and can't go higher. So no budget changes proposed. <laughs> Under category seven are comments around Lake Carmine, the alum treatment um, itself and the feasibility study. There was some slightly mixed feedback from public comment received. Um, the public hearing commenters and an email indicated appreciation for the Clean Water Board 
in setting aside $750,000 in line 2.4, the innovative and alternatives line to support potential implementation of the alum treatment pending the results of the feasibility study. But there were also comments on the online questionnaire asking the board to skip the feasibility study and jump straight to implementation, as well as one indicating concern that there's still insufficient funding for Lake Carmine. The proposed response here is that the state's trying to follow a very stepwise and planned process um, that relies on careful feasibility planning and permitting assessment, and that this additional $750,000 really demonstrates the state's commitment to implementing the crisis response plan for Lake Carmi, so no budget change is proposed. Category eight is about conventional agricultural systems, agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, and agricultural regulation. The board received one email comment, an additional email um, indicating concurrence with the first email that focused on the role of conventional agriculture and water quality management. So some key takeaways from that email include concern from the member of the public that conventional or non-organic agriculture is a major contributor to Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions and water pollution, and also that the clean water budget doesn't force or encourage transition towards organic management as a result. And there were also a few comments in the online questionnaire that requested more focus on industrial farm runoff and agricultural enforcement. So there's quite a few um, bullet points here in terms of a response. And the first is that regulatory enforcement is outside the purview of the Clean Water Board. Again, the Clean Water Board is really focused on assignment of, of budgets to funding programs. Although the state of Vermont does acknowledge acknowledge it's really important to fund technical assistance and support to regulated communities so that they can um, be aided in complying with these regulations. Additionally, line item 1.51 um, includes funding for water quality staff at the Agency of Agriculture to perform farm inspections and technical assistance. So there is a portion of the clean water budget that supports regulation via, um, via staff support. Addressing greenhouse gas emissions is beyond the scope of the Clean Water Board, but there are greenhouse gas emission reduction co-benefits that can be associated with a lot of the clean water projects that get implemented on the ground. Within the budget, line 1.4, water quality grants to partners of farmers, and 2.3, water quality farm improvement retirement, both fund well-researched and vetted best management practices known to reduce ag runoff and improve water quality. Additionally, the line 2.3 water quality farm improvement retirement funds farm retirement and easement projects where there's a significant water quality benefit to removing or restricting agricultural production and where ag and water quality maybe can't coexist. The outside of the clean water budget, the US Department of Agricultural Natural Resources Conservation Service has unprecedented funded levels right now to support such things as water quality improvement greenhouse gas mitigation, and transition planning to organic production. So given the context of the clean water budget within our funding partner context, no budget changes proposed. Um, category nine, there were a few questions that really lean more about the results or outcomes of the clean water investments. So an email comment addressed the need to consider water quality monitoring data in addition to the modeled estimates and asking for information about that. And then an, another comment asked about the results of funding and financing for municipal wastewater treatment infrastructure, excuse me, um, and some of the uh, results of investments in abating, abatement of combined sewer overflows. So this response really outlines and directs folks to the Vermont Clean Water Initiative Annual Performance Report and Clean Water Interactive Dashboard, which provides a whole bunch of information on the out outcomes of these investments. And additionally, a little bit lower, this response points to all the different entities who are actively monitoring water quality, where to find the water quality data, and how that then feeds into our um, water quality planning long-term. And then finally, category 10, we received some recommended improvements about the clean water budget public comment process, namely about employing more plain language and increasing digital accessibility and the response here is that the state of Vermont is, is promoting improved language access, digital accessibility, and plain language. We really appreciate this feedback and hope to continue to, to make improvements in future years. Thanks. Thank you, Joanna. Sure.
So that concludes the presentation. Thank you to Colleen and Gianna for your presentation on the public comment period and the responsiveness summary. And it back to you, Doug. Thank you, Emily. Um, all right, so we'll start with board discussion. Uh, the first item is the request for the increased funding on line 1.2. Um, the DEC recommendation being 100,000 increase so 650 to 750k so, uh is would you like me to stop sharing nicely. my screen so that you can see people's um video oh sure yeah that's good there we go so do any members of the board have any questions comments concerns about that increase Um, yeah, Chad Tyler. Go ahead. Um, I kind of feel I need to almost recuse myself as one of these letters came from um, the Friends of North Lake Champlain, but thankfully Love jumped in. I think if it is becomes part of the base funding, um, I think the $100,000 uh, seems um, fair. Uh, otherwise, I would have fought for the $200,000. Uh, we put a lot of work to get these groups together, and I think they need to be funded uh, for the capacity. This is some new work, so that's just my two cents. Yeah, you're saying, Julie? I just, I, I think it, it sort of threads the, the needle well that, I, as Chad indicated, there is increased work, but at the same time, there's also uh, state agencies have a lot of uh, pressure on their budgets that we're being asked to absorb, and I think it, it balances sort of those two competing financial dynamics that we're currently subject to in a way that makes sense and we can take it up again next year if it concerns remain and it feels insufficient. May I just add a, a point of context as well? Um, we have roughly a million dollars that will be rolling out this year in clean water workforce capacity development through a block grant program and just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that additional piece of context because it, it's complementary to the basin planning funds in terms of respond being responsive to the organizational capacity needs. Thank you. I think that's helpful context. I do agree with both striking a balance and um, you know not considering it a closed issue as far as next year goes. So I think probably anticipating to revisit it next year and see if um based on what other programs are running and what other funds are available if that line that 750 is sufficient at that point or not the inflationary environment has been very unstable lately right so um Challenge. it could go a number of directions all right any further discussion on Line 1.2. Right. Seeing none, we'll move on to um, addressing Act 69 of 2023, the report, House Corrections and Institutions. Um, and Julie, would you be able to help me out with an overview of this one? Board members? Yeah. I'm trying to. Maybe I'll catch you. Okay. No problem. That'd be fun. Uh, so last year's Capitol Bill, Act 69 of 2023, uh, it's the clean water section of the Capitol Bill since it operates on a two-year cycle. Uh, the state fiscal year 24 board recommendation was was baked into that that bill or that act. And then for looking forward to state fiscal year 2025, they requested that the board again make a budget recommendation for the clean water section of the Capitol Bill which is usual practice and that that gets presented to those committees in December as part of the broader capital bill budget package that the administration coordinates. Uh, but new this, this past year was an explicit ask to make a recommendation on whether there are any other funding sources that could be used for municipal pollution control grants in state fiscal year 2025. And baked into the board's budget recommendation that we have presented today um, is basically an acknowledgement that pollution control grants are really 
uh, the best fit is the capital bill. It's traditionally the long-term funding source. It's highly aligned with the eligibility and the prioritization of the capital bill. And so, no, there is there is no alternative funding that is recommended to fund municipal pollution control grants that fund quite a bit of, of wastewater infrastructure um, improvements. And But I wanted to also just highlight that the basis of this recommendation was that um, the budget target for the capital bill in FY25 was reduced from the usual 10 to $12 million per year down to $6 million a year. So there was a roughly $4 million gap. And as part of building the state fiscal year 2025 clean water budget, we proposed to fill that gap with clean water fund all unallocated unreserved revenue as a one-time fix to that, to that gap, um, understanding that this capital bill is going to have a lot of pressure on it from the flood recovery and response. Uh, so it, it was not recommended to find an alternative source for pollution control grants, uh, but it was recommended to fill that $4 million gap that supports other clean water budget line items from the capital bill uh, by using that unallocated unreserved clean water fund revenue. And just wanted to highlight also that this really needs to be viewed as a one-time kind of emergency allocation because the state heavily relies on a fully funded capital bill of roughly 10 to $12 million a year to meet our long-term clean water funding commitment that's in statute of approximately 50 to $60 million a year. So I just wanted to kind of provide that temporal context, but uh, clarify how the, the budget is proposed to address that in this year. So by way of the board making this budget recommendation, we're effectively addressing this reporting expectation um, to the committees. Yeah. If I could just add a couple of things to that, I think it's important to know that the um, state revolving fund match coming out of the Capitol bill predates the Clean Water Board and dates back to the earliest days of the Clean and Clear program in 2006, maybe, or something like that. Like it, it stretches way back. Mm -hmm. um, and just would emphasize the point Emily made is there was a, a funding report that was done, I want to say in 2017, that looked at sort of the long term needs. It was the the agency prepared it sort of building on the work that had been done by Treasurer Pierce to estimate what the state's sort of right share was mm -hmm. of clean water funding. And it is premised on the assumption of this 10 to $12 million a year coming out of the capital bill. And so just, I, I think it is really important to be very clear with the legislature. We were able to sort of fill that gap with one time money this one time, but that is not an, absent them restoring kind of that level of funding in the capital bill to our clean water work, we're going to fall short of the obligations that, that have been kind of mutually agreed to in terms of the level of funding needed. Yeah, and from my involvement in the original work with Treasurer Pierce from the tax department side of the table, the, the capital bill was always there was never an express intent of, of designing a system that would move away from the capital bill. Um, I think it was always envisioned as part of the funding stack for, for the clean water work. Um, and the, the arrangements made last year to balance the help balance the capital bill were in no way intended to be a long term uh, adjustment to the approach. Um, at the risk of being over my skis, I'm doing this a lot lately. <laughs> We have maintained a fixed amount, which means from an inflationary perspective, we're actually drawing less on the capital bill as time goes on. So if anything, I think, or not this year, but maybe in a future year would need to address the question of, you know, is a fixed capital bill request really the right structure or should there be some type of um, mechanism to say this proportion or this amount of effort is coming out of the capital bill construct. Um, not just 10 to $12 million a year. We have a tendency in Vermont to set amounts and then those amounts become stale over time. Um, so I think if we were finding alternative funding mechanisms, alternative sources for clean water work, it should be approached in the same way that we approached the ARPA state fiscal where it was layered 
on top of the existing efforts and it didn't replace the efforts. Um, the whole purpose of the agreement with the EPA is to show long term commitment and long term devotion. So um, reducing our capital bill uh, investments would not really line up with that uh, purpose. But I wanted to make sure that, um, and thank you for the refresher, Emily and Julie. Uh, I wanted to make sure that members of the board understood that, you know, the current construct really does kind of take that position without explicitly laying all of that out for the legislature, but it does kind of take position that, um, you know, the, the investment from the capital bill should, should be restored and should make, be maintained going forward. Yeah, then just I guess I'm not exactly clear how are we intent intending to call this out explicitly? I know the Clean Water Performance Report sort of addresses numerous statutory reporting obligations we have. Is the intent to sort of add this to the list of obligations that that report speaks to and maybe have us like a paragraph or two that sort of summarizes this conversation? I just I guess I feel like it's important to have something to point back to um, if there is any indication that folks are looking to make a six million dollar capital bill appropriation the new normal that we want to be very explicit in stating it's not we've not only is the capital bill the right source um, but that 10 to 12 million dollar a year commitment is sort of an, an expectation almost. Mm -hmm. Or there's some narrative that was in the clean water budget overview document that could very easily be you know, copy and pasted into the appropriate mechanism for reporting back to the committees. The performance report may be one of those mechanisms or the, the budget paperwork or the capital bill budget adjustment paperwork memos that get submitted um, as part of the governor's recommendation could be another option for that. And I defer to uh, defer to I you. defer to <laughs> the board chair on what you think would be the best um, avenue for making sure that narrative gets to the right committee members. I think the the I mean the closest nexus is to make sure to ask DFM to um, the capital bill EAA are we yeah. Um, I'm trying to think where we are in the cycle there, but uh, yeah, we're in the second year. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so because that would just be the closest point to the to the issue, right? Mm -hmm. We can work to get that language sure. uh, to Kristen and Adam to add into the capital. I guess Sean and Kristen to add into the capital. Right. That sounds like a good thing. Any more discussion on that topic? Any questions or concerns? All right. Seeing none, where are we on time? Sorry. It is 310. 310. Opening it up uh, just since we have a little bit of window there. Any members of the board have any other comments on the current version of the budget that they'd like to go into? Jim? Oh, yeah, you're, you're on mute. mute. I guess it's not so much on the budget, but I sort of a overall question in terms of, you know, we have measurements for all the different projects of how much we're doing phosphorus reduction and pollution reduction. But do we have any estimate of the damage the other way from the flooding with the, you know, numerous wastewater treatment plants being offline for, you know, quite a number of weeks in some cases? Um, so do we have any modeling estimate? And then how does that fit with our goals with the EPA on reduction? Yeah, it's a good question, Jim. Um, actually, something I was going to raise more towards the end for awareness. This came up in the all member legislative briefing. Um, so shortly after the flooding event, uh, Vermont Emergency Management approached the EPA about um, treating the additional 
discharge into Lake Champlain from the flooding event, which I think we have some early measurements or estimates of, but they're you know quite early. Um, treating those as uh, trying to get those as reimbursable damage from the event, in, a, in essence, trying to find federal sources to help clean that up, because the that type of damage to natural um, bodies doesn't fall under the FEMA Public Assistance Program. It's they kind of look for built infrastructure, and that's what they're really primarily concerned with. Um, and so we started one for one. We got that event and that impact on the EPA's radar so that in the event they try to, um, you know, hold us accountable for it down the road, uh, this would help head that off and also try to secure additional funds. Our search for additional funds there hasn't been promising so far. We haven't given up yet. And part of the legislative comment was this didn't just push more phosphorus and more um, waste of other kinds into Lake Champlain. It also pushed into all of Vermont's lakes. So it's a statewide problem since the the type of this event being inundation just kind of just pushed a massive amount of material of many types through our through our river system. Um, so we're going to continue to pursue that. And my one of my other hats as chief recovery officer, I'm going to try to find um, money to help us mitigate those impacts from a phosphorus perspective as well as others um because like we know for instance the john the damage to the johnson facility um they're not mitigating uh their discharge to the same level that they were before the event correct me if i'm wrong there but they've gotten back to it they have but there was a yeah month or two month period where they were not right so, yeah um i Matthew Vaughn from the Lake Champlain Basin Program has done a fairly extensive analysis of the impact. Um, I think, you know, these are ultimately our compliance is based on long term monitoring data. And so this is a short term effect, um, though, to the extent these have these kinds of events happen more regularly. They could have a cumulative impact on our overall progress, but climate change and more extreme precipitation is factored into the modeling that underpins um, our plan. But I wonder if inviting Matt to come to the next Clean Water Board meeting and give um, a version of, of the presentation I know he recently gave to the Citizens Advisory Committee, and I got to see it at Basin Program mm -hmm. um, Steering Committee meeting several months ago might be instructive for folks because it, it it's it's pretty jaw dropping mm -hmm. um, the amount of sediment and phosphorus that moved through our river systems um, immediately following in the week I guess following the the flood event. That's great. We're also in contact with Matt to plan a public webinar through our Clean Water Conversation Ooh. series. So maybe it's even just circulating that opportunity yeah. clearly to the board. Exactly. Um, and that that's scheduled for January. I don't have the exact date on mind right now, but we can make sure that the Clean Water Board is invited to that event if that would be appropriate. Um, yeah. All public, so everyone Everyone in attendance is welcome to join, and we'll be advertising that through our, our the same listserv we use to advertise these board meetings. Great. And the performance report that will be published this January, um, it does acknowledge the flood events of summer 2023, and there's some additional context provided around um, monitoring data and taking that into consideration when we're, we're looking at our, our collective progress implementing the phosphorus reduction goals for Lake Champlain. So there will be additional um, narrative and data available in that report, but we understand it's an ongoing point um, of uh, context that needs to be taken into consideration whenever we're presenting the phosphorus reductions associated with the projects we're implementing through this budget. We're making gains, but there's other factors across the landscape that are going to impact actual phosphorus loading to the lake, and that needs to be part of the the complete consideration of our progress. So we appreciate that point and are, are working to incorporate that into, into the report. Before moving on to Bob's question, Julie, I don't think that the structure of the current domestic supplement bill ask would really touch on this at all. 
So we could revisit that perhaps. Um, sorry for a little bit more from the members online. Um, the administration constructed a, a, a package of requests for supplemental funding sources to recover from the disaster. The congressional delegation is moving forward and pushing for at the federal level. Um, there, there actually, there is one now that I've started scrolling oh, through okay. it in my mind, which is one of the suggestions we made. Is there's uh, the basin program when it was reauthorized, received mm -hmm. an additional um, author, federal authorization of $10 million above where it had been. So mm -hmm. it's authorized, but not appropriated now. I think it's 25 million instead of 15. And one of the suggestions we made, and Neil Cannon may be able to help make sure I'm not botching any of the details here, um, but there, I believe there's $10 million worth of headroom in the Mason program authorization, and we had asked for um, consideration to be given to fully appropriating that amount with some of those dollars going to support work um, in, in the Lake Champlain watershed. Right. No, that's a good point because it was broader than just the, the sediment from the flood. It was, Correct. yeah. I don't know, Neil, if I got that correct. No, you did. Absolutely, Julie. Yes. Great. Yeah. I mean, Julie, if it, uh, Secretary, sorry, if I could maybe reemphasize a point that I heard you make, which is, I'll ask permission to do that before that I do. All yeah, right, please. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the way the TMDLs function is it is very unfortunate that the floods loaded the watersheds up with so much sediment that moved downstream. But once it's down, unfortunately, you can't really get it back. And the only way you could is extremely expensive interventions like dredging, which don't really get us anywhere um, anyway. So, you know, additional investments in this area would really be about, um, you know, additional flood resilience or about you know, keeping any additional sediment that may be loaded up in the watershed and displaced from one area of the watershed downstream to another from further displacing its way all the way down into the lake ultimately or other surface waters, like you said, um, Doug. So I'll leave that there, but it's 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 easier to control it than to pull it back. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Neil. All right, moving on, Bob. Thank you. Just a minor thing first. I don't suppose the camera could be shifted a little bit so we could see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, I'm I'm uh, the secretary has a special. Hey, she knows is. exactly how to do this. <laughs> yes. Well, oh, you have the remote. Yeah, there you go. Definitely <laughs> did it manually. It's fine. We're <laughs> fine with it shifting that way. <laughs> uh, it gives new meanings to talking with your hands, Doug. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> um, and then I was reflecting on what Emily was saying during the, the presentation about the public comment. And I know way back when this group or this iteration of the group kind of got going, we talked about the, the language of, of all of this is somewhat technical and, and how to figure out. And I don't know the answers to the questions I'm raising, but just trying to be cognizant of using plain language and finding ways to relate it so that people who aren't necessarily being affected yet by this issue would realize why it's an important policy priority for the state and why it's important for resources. In a, in a weird way, the flooding was an opportunity, right? Because because more people certainly down this way and obviously in very Montpelier were impacted by it. So you could you could sort of understand why. Oh yeah, this stuff is important, um, not just during disasters. So for what it's worth, but if we can continue to think of ways to to make this more relatable. Uh, that's actually really interesting. It, may, it makes me think we so I'm also on the um, the Climate Council and uh, we have recently went through a rulemaking process related to the advanced clean car and clean truck standards. And similarly, it is incredibly dense technically and realize taking these dense standards out to the public and trying to engage them in a conversation about them wasn't going to be constructive. And so instead, uh, the team worked to create a set of conversations around what supporting policies Vermonters thought would be needed in order to successfully deploy electric vehicles at a at a wide scale, right? As opposed to the intricacies of 
uh, electric vehicle construction in the automakers, which we can't really affect anyways. I wonder if they might not have some lessons learned, Emily, right. um, between Jane and, and Rachel Stevens worked really hard on that to come up with a way where it, it felt more accessible for, for um, Vermonters to provide input and it actually impacts how we think about structuring the program for success, even if it's not the sort of technical components that can be pretty hard to engage in. That's great. Um, well, I don't know about if that aligns with what you were thinking, but that's exactly where my mind went. Okay. Um, following up on um, on what Bob was saying, I wanted to comment on the same thing, kind of going back to the public engagement. Uh, which was pretty abysmal. And um, the fact that we have the same people, uh, I think, Bob, I think they worked pretty hard within that chart to make it quite accessible. But uh, if, if the language can be made accessible, but if it's not being seen, I'm not sure how the engagement, it just seems is, is really um, just not there. And so it brings me back to those notes. The yeah, I suppose complexity is part of it. I just think reach and effectiveness, the effectiveness of publicizing it. Um, I, I just don't see it out there. Of course, I don't do a lot of social media or anything like that. But um, and I also question the next point, the increased volume of funding in the system and capacity of the public. Could, could someone describe that for me a bit better, how that limits engagement? Sure, I, and I think maybe that one is a little bit more targeted at our traditional like stakeholder network where there's so much additional funding in the system. I think folks have really been focused on implementing that funding and, and doing the work and there might be a little bit less of an emphasis around raising more money because organizations, I think, and, and agencies are feeling quite inundated with the, the increased volume of, of funding at the moment, but it is certainly something that comes in waves. Um, and, you know, there's been quite a, you know, a rise with ARPA and and then we're going to be on the on the downswing. So um, I, I guess we were just speculating that there might be a, a correlation between how much funding we're trying to get out on the ground and implemented and, and capacity to be able to take time away from that to to participate in the, the public comment on the budgeting side was, yeah. I think, what we were trying to get at. But like put, Gianna said. To put it bluntly, when Vermont came up with 40 to $50 million a year for clean water investments, that was a huge investment, a huge sacrifice in our terms. We got a billion dollars of CRF that we spent in one year. We got a billion dollars of state fiscal recovery that we're still spending. And we're going to spend about $700 million six to seven hundred million on flood recovery mm -hmm. so and those are all compressed into two to three to up to the best timeline the best is a five-year timeline um, so yeah exactly. it's all very um high pressure and i didn't even talk about bill no and, and i said i i spoke with the association of general contractors this morning and very much said the same thing that a lot of these opportunities are falling to the same staff within state agencies and then to the same um, consultants and contractors and uh, partner organizations that work in, in this the sort of clean water, water quality base. Um, and so it is, I, I think it does feel a little bit like an, an embarrassment of riches, <laughs> um, as well as a set of challenges that come with those riches that both folks are experiencing right now. And just, really strained under the capacity with capacity yeah. to to do things that feel like they may be more optional. Mm -hmm. I just from, it just strikes me that there there there's this perception to me I think we're still 10 million dollars short. I mean I thought the target was wasn't it 50 to 60 million for this budget and um and I I'm not sure what creative ways we have of coming up, you know, once these ARPA funds are gone and um we're going to have to come up with some more money to stay there. I don't like the uh, idea that maybe people feel, well, they've got all the money they need for clean water. Let's move on to something else. Um, but I know innovation is part of this budget and I'm not addressing it you know, necessarily for this year. I think you guys have done amazing work and where we're at, but um, that education still getting out what you guys are doing, I think is really important. I think that's a good flag, Chad, but I would say it's not people 
thinking, oh, there's enough money going towards clean water. I think it's more people shifting their focus away from clean water because they're more concerned about the big, the housing problem, the climate work. I think it's getting drowned in in some of the other current issues that we're we're dealing with. No, um, I, yeah. Just wanted to address it, as you say, as a point. Yeah, and um, I think you are correct in that the target long term funding was about ten million dollars higher than the current levels. Yeah, it's fifty to sixty million in statute, but it also yeah. says in statute that should be adjusted for inflation over time. And I we haven't we haven't done that adjustment. It would probably be worth looking into that. Um, but it it isn't just limited to clean water fund and capital bill. It also that it takes into account the transportation bill, the Lake Champlain Basin program money that is administered by the state of Vermont, um, and a couple of the other federal um sources that flow to well i guess transportation bill is the big one <laughs> yeah, yeah so um and, and that's a temporary plus up for, yeah yeah it does it, as does the basin program it's got an eight million dollar a year plus up under the bipartisan infrastructure law itself for clean water work so mm -hmm. yeah it, i think as um the term of the bipartisan infrastructure law in particular kind of rolls on and we start to get close to the end of that, that period of increased resources in certain areas of this work, it, it, there, there's the potential for there to be a fairly significant cliff on the back end because there's money both in A&R's budget, B-Trans's budget, and the Basin Program's budget that's all sort of keeping uh, funding levels fairly high right now in the overall system mm -hmm. and it will all I think die back at once. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe my term will end before then. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope for the same, Chad. <laughs> Personally, not about you. <laughs> Thank you guys for the consideration. Yeah. Thank you for the additional com uh, discussion. I think we should move on to public comment at this point so that we can uh, make sure that we give people enough adequate time. Yeah. Great. Um, so the public comment agenda item, we have until 350 roughly for this, um, and we have five folks who have signed up ahead of time for public comment. We usually aim for roughly two minutes per commenter, um, but I, we may have some extra capacity um, to give folks a little bit more time. Um, would you like us to set a time limit or a timer? Uh, for say three minutes per commenter. Yeah, let's go just with three. To help keep us on track in case there's others in attendance who didn't sign up to comment ahead of time but would like to comment. Uh, so first on our list is um, Ernie Englehart right here in the room with us. Um, and Ernie, you had shared some photos that I can put up on screen share okay, as thanks. you're giving your remarks if that still works for you. All right, thank you. There we go. Would you like me to just flip through these as yeah, we're and speaking? when you get to the last one, you could just hold that. OK, so just here. slowly go through those. I expect I'll be about two minutes. OK, thanks, Emily. Um, I'm Ernie Engelhart. I'm on the board of directors for the Lake Armour Campers Association. And, and we want to thank you, members of the Clean Water Board for your continued support of our efforts to bring our ailing, unhealthy Lake Carmine back to full health and make it a lake that will meet the standards of the Clean Water Act. The year 2017 was a watershed moment, unintended, with a terrible cyanobacteria outbreak, a clarion call which has been developing over decades. For the past six years, a coalition of many groups has assembled to form a partnership dedicated to saving and restoring this wonderful state resource. These include ANR, the CNC, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, the Agency of Ag, Food and Marketing, the Farming Community, the Town of Franklin, the Franklin Watershed Committee, the Lake Harmer Campus Association, and many other groups um, have uh, helped us out in this effort. We certainly appreciate the board for recognizing the seriousness of our crisis. 
the partnership that I mentioned is needed. All the help we can get to keep our morale up on a strong Clinton restoring this lake to full health. Much has been done, but as you have seen from these slides and heard from us before, much more needs to be done. The task of the current thorough and scientific study like Carmine is to provide the state with the information needed to take the next step in this restoration process, including a use of alum to lock the legacy phosphorus, the source of our problem, for the bottom of the lake. The west note of the cost for this step is currently available, but it will be substantial and likely a multi-year effort. We request that the board continually uh, continues to financially support Lake Carmi through this urgently needed restoration effort. We remain cautiously optimistic that our lake can recover, and that the state of Vermont can once again be proud of Lake Carmi. A lot of families and visitors, children, grandchildren, families, friends, and all the recreated Lake Carmi deserve a gift from us that restores our lake to one that always looks like a beautiful lake depicted in the last slide. Thank you very much for your time and commitment to us. Thank you. Ernie. Thank you, Ernie. I have to say, I was trying really hard to figure out what was wrong with the lake in the last slide. When it was <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> It looks, good. looks pretty spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next uh, on our list to comment is James Maroney. I believe Mr. Maroney is on the Teams meeting. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see that. Uh, if you are, oh, there you are. Great. If you can unmute yourself. Um, At least I see him on this screen. James, are you able to unmute yourself? Unfortunately, I cannot unmute for you. Or it, it looks like his video may be frozen. Yeah, we'll come. Oh, oh are you there? Uh, Mr. Maroney, we'll come back to you. Hopefully, um, your internet will catch up and we'll be able to hear from you in a moment. Okay, so next on the list is Bruce McGurk. Let's see, it's Mr. McGurk in attendance. I don't think he joined. Okay. May not have made it to the meeting. Okay. Um, and next on the list is Sylvia Knight. Hi, Sylvia, if you're able to um, unmute yourself so we can hear from you. In the, um, there should be a little microphone icon that if you select that, it will unmute your microphone. We have that slide. Oh, you're oh. there? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. OK. Um, I, it's, I can't look at my the comments that I wrote while looking at the screen. I'm not that advanced, so I'll try to get as close as I can. Um, I thank you all for your detailed dis, uh, discussion of this budget. Um, and for your work on the public comments. Uh, I have some thoughts about my, my experience uh, with parts of the Vermont government um, around pesticides and water quality has led me to, to um, offer three uh, thoughts that I, that I see um, uh, in operation. Um, and 
these are these are three concepts at the base of ANR's um, planning, water planning and budgeting. And the first one, the first principle, the first concept that I see operative is that the plan treats water as separate from us. The second is that it treats water as a receptacle for our wastes. And the third assumes infinite capacity of the water to absorb toxins without adverse effects. Um, th these assumptions are essentially um, ecologically and legally, uh, th they're not true. And they're legally and ecologically incorrect. So I, I think that we need to examine the principles and the assumptions by which we operate in regard to water. We are all intimately connected with water. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the whole earth and it is a hydrological cycle. Earth's hydrological cycle, the waters move, they don't belong to us. We're contaminating international waters. Um, and they fail to solve, if we continue with these principles, we'll fail to solve any of the problems that we're concerned about in Lake Champlain. So I think it's time for a paradigm change and it, that's gonna take some hard work. But I want to thank you for at least thinking about the budget and, and trying to explain it to us. I have written comments uh, that I've already submitted on specific um, ideas and concepts in your budget. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for your comments. And we received your written comments. We will attach that to the meeting minutes that are posted for this. Today's board meeting. Thank you. Am I recorded? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Emily, yes. Mr. Maroney just rejoined unmuted and I'm hesitant to remute him. If yes. you want to see if he'd like to. Uh, James Maroney, are you available to um, share your comments now? Uh, I think so. If you can hear me, then I am. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, um one minute here please uh i i understand that i have like two or three minutes so um that's not very much time so uh, here is the executive summary of my uh, remarks conventional farming is the proximate cause of of overproduction uh over, low milk prices farm attrition 45 percent of water and 16 to 20 percent of atmospheric pollution and broad-based rural economic decay. If Vermont permits its farmers to farm conventionally, these results will continue to obtain. The 2025 clean water budget makes no effort to manage the root cause of these results or even to acknowledge it. Consequently, the state of Vermont is not on track to meet its clean water or uh, uh, Global Warming Solutions Act targets. In looking over the draft state fiscal year 2025 clean water budget, I do not see one line item that is intended to address water and atmospheric pollution caused by conventional dairy. They all either try to distract attention away from the root cause or to spend money on programs designed to compensate for it. The clean water budget states that its plan for agriculture is, quote, cost effective, supports the agricultural economy and improves soil health. It does none of these. The 2025 clean water budget is an expression of the Vermont uh, Agency of Agriculture's refusal to acknowledge that the environmental, economic, and social costs of conventional farming far exceed its benefits. Notwithstanding, the authors of the 2025 clean water budget have made the decision to double down on their support for conventional farming to help them maintain yields, to help them overproduce FMO uh, milk markets, to help them lower farm income, to help them drive farm attrition, and to help them destroy soil health. The only way to arrest these trends is to stop farming conventionally and convert all Vermont farming to organic. All farmers who agree to convert must be compensated. 
The paradigm cannot be tweaked to make it climate or water quality friendly. Conventional farming was designed to externalize its wastes into the environment and its results are inalienable to it. They are not caused as the agency would have us or as the state of Vermont would have us believe by a few sloppy farmers or a few inveterate rule makers. Uh, the rest of my comments uh, are in the file. Uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that any members of the board have. Or anybody on this call for that matter. Any questions? Uh, one question actually. Murray, how would you, what is your definition of conventional farming? Uh, th that is uh, f farming that is that is um, dependent upon fossil fuels uh, that imports huge amounts of uh, of uh, nutrients into the system in the, in the, uh, which are derived from fossil fuels. Um, it, it is the uh, is the predominant modality of farming in Vermont today. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. I'd also like to just, uh, while I have the time, I'd like to call attention to something Neil Kamen said a moment ago. It's a great deal easier to control uh, substances that are in the water than to pull uh, them back. I'd like to reiterate that. It's a lot easier to stop this problem at its source, which is the importation of these nutrients, than it is to try to get them out of the lake once they're in there. Thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, let's see. The next person who is signed up to comment is uh, Peter Benevento. Is Peter in the meeting? I don't think I saw him either. Yes, oh, I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Oh. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Pete Benevento. Um, I'm president of the Lake Carmi Campus Association, and I've been involved in water quality efforts at Lake Carmi. Uh, for almost 20 years. It's good to see Neil Kamen at this meeting. Neil Kamen started us off oh, 15, 16 years ago on our water sampling at Lake Carmi, much of which the data, of the data that's come from that water sampling um, has led us to where we are today. And I won't go over, Ernie made such a fine presentation depicting the current state of, of Lake Carmi. Uh, as his slides indicate, um, the blooms haven't test intensified over the last several years uh, to where it has created just a very unhealthy environment at Lake Carmi. And this is for much of the, of the summer season, much of the season when people like to enjoy the lake. It's, it's not just at the tail end of the season in September. These blooms start in July and unfortunately last most of the summer and just uh, you can't enjoy the lake. Um, I couldn't allow my dog to go into the lake. And much of the time, I wouldn't even go into the lake from my dock this past season. Um, and it's so contrary to what we all feel is the Vermont brand of a clean and healthy atmosphere. So we, we have to correct this. Um, and the other thing is the local economy. People, people don't come to the lake when it's in the state of a blue-green algae bloom. And moreover, they don't come to the Lake Carmi State Park, which is the largest state park in the state. Um, and I know you've all heard this before, so you know I won't go on and on because I could go on and on, but we now have the opportunity to make the lake healthy in anticipation of the current ongoing Allen feasibility study, which we are very appreciative of the support and the funding that the Clean Water Board gave us so that that study could be performed. But in anticipation, of that study recommending that an alum treatment be conducted on Lake Carmi, we, we asked that full funding be given so that there's a, for a full treatment of alum for Lake Carmi to try to eradicate this blue-green algae problem for all, forever, hopefully. Um, we need to act now. We also need to, to resolve any potential permitting obstacles um, that that have been uh, or may have arise in the process. 
um, because it's, it's again, it's we're at a point at Lake Carmi where we, we can't enjoy the lake. Um, it's not sustainable. Um, we, we need to make the lake healthy again. Um, and thank you. And thank you for caring for Lake Carmi. Thank you for your comment. That uh, is the list of folks who had signed up ahead of time to comment. Um, would you like to open it up in case there's anyone else? Yeah, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so let's open it up. Um, anyone who didn't sign up, uh, if you can, you can raise your hand visually or with Teams, or if you're not able to do that, just unmute and let us know you'd like to comment. Right. Seeing none. Um, thank you, everyone, for your public comments. I think it's always helpful to hear perspectives. I do think um, I myself have found myself getting uh, perhaps overly casual in how I'm approaching these meetings. So it is good to remind us of the importance of the work. As Chad was saying earlier, it is good to remember that there are targets that, you know, uh, are very important and that there is a risk of us missing those if we um, don't continue to to keep an eye on trends in funding, trends in positions, you know, and um, continue to invest in clean water. Uh, one thing I would say is that this board does have a fairly narrow statutory purpose and very narrow authority um, to affect the larger environment which we operate in. Um, so I would encourage I appreciate the comments. I think they are very helpful for the board to hear. Some of those issues are going to fall well outside of the board's authority to influence. And I would encourage you to not only connect with your representatives, your senators and representatives in your area, but also the natural resources committees uh, to share your perspective because um, the board, I think it's helpful to hear. Uh, but I think in those larger in those larger conversations, the board is going to have a very limited uh, ability to influence. Even in carrying recommendations to the Vermont legislature, um, I have to confine myself to making recommendations that are consistent with the purpose of the board as the Clean Water Board Chair. If I carried comments that were outside of my scope, I would, I would lose the trust of the legislatures um, that I was sticking to the role which the, the statute had assigned me. Um, so again, you, as members of the public, you should never filter what you want to comment on. You should always give us your full feedback. Uh, but I would I would strongly encourage you to share it with your legislators uh, because for some of those issues, uh, they would certainly require legislative action. And, and it can only be uh, if you if you truly desire change, it could only be achieved by the General Assembly. Uh, so that being said, um, I'd like to move on to the next section, the adoption of the state fiscal year 2025 Clean Water Budget for recommendation to Governor Scott. Uh, do I have any members of the board? Uh, the draft motion is in the agenda. Do I have any members of the board who are willing to make that motion? I would move to approve the adoption of the SFY 2025 Clean Water Budget recommendation as proposed in supporting material number four. Thank you, Secretary Moore. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Tate. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. I actually appreciate the raised hands as well. <laughs> All opposed, say nay. All right. The ayes have it. And I meant to say aye. So <laughs> um, let's just count the hands. Um, all right, Emily, do you want to handle the next section for us then? Sure. The next item on the agenda is other business and next steps uh, for the Clean Water Board. Wanted to give a status update on our annual Vermont Clean Water Initiative Performance Report. Wanted to send a, a big thank you out to all of the agency staff that have worked with us this year to again compile data on clean water projects that have been funded and implemented through state funding programs, federal funding programs, and regulations. Uh, into the very large data set that is compiled each year to be able to produce this report. The 
report draft is completed its review by reporting partners and agency staff at this point. And our team uh, led by Claire Madden is in the process of integrating those comments into a final draft that will be sent to agency leadership for review prior to submittal to the legislature. Um, and we will make sure that the Clean Water Board receives a copy of that report. Um, and it will also be posted on our website in multiple places and promoted through our list serve and through a press release and social media. So more to come on that. It is uh, it will be available by January 15th, which is the deadline for submittal to the legislature. And that report is also submitted to the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. They use that report as a mechanism to evaluate our progress implementing the phosphorus reduction goals for Lake Champlain. Uh, so that's an additional audience that receives the report and they will uh, issue us a report card on how we're doing based on that report. So more to come there, uh, but wanted to share a status update on that. Um, following today's meeting, I'll also be following up to initiate scheduling for the next Clean Water Board meeting that is typically held in February. And at that Clean Water Board meeting, as usual, we will be reviewing the updated Clean Water Fund operating statement to check in on how revenues are tracking compared to what we projected and to determine if there's any adjustments to the budget that may be needed based on revenue tracking. Um, and we will also be able to report back to the board on the governor's recommended budget at that point in time. Um, in addition to that typical business for the February board meeting, we have a couple of items carried over from our last February board meeting to review and approve the contingency reserve plan. We have um, incorporated updates into that based on the previous Clean Water Board discussion, and we'll be sending that out uh, well in advance of the February board meeting to make sure board members have a chance to review and digest that and bring your comments um, to that meeting for discussion. And then finally, that uh, February board meeting, we will review and consult with the board on the water quality trading report, which is required in statute. That was also carried over from, from the last uh, February board meeting. So we'll be following up on those two items um, in February. Okay, and then finally, uh, the, the last item of other business here is that we have four public board members on, on the board. And, and thank you for your time and commitment to this board. Wanted to note that those terms expire February of 2024. Um, and uh, Doug has asked me to collect, um, if folks are interested in staying on, on the board, please contact me um, at my email address and I can compile uh, interest in staying on or ending your term. And I will follow up with Secretary Moore um, and our chair, Doug uh, Farnham, to make sure that we're, um, you know, coordinating that process and that will ultimately be led through the governor's office to do the board appointments, but um, we'll be sending out a follow up note to board members, just a reminder um, to let me know if, if what you're interested in terms of staying on on the clean water board. I think that concludes other business. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add or anything I missed? No, you okay. covered it all, Emily. Thank you. I think we can adjourn this meeting of the Clean Water Board. And Neil, I was hoping that you could stay on for a little bit. One of the things you said jarred with something loose, and I just wanted to yep, say it before. Absolutely. I Any number of things I'm sure we could talk about, so that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to, to join us today. Thank Happy you. Holidays, Thank you. Happy holidays, Happy everyone. Holidays.